Bibles open to the book of Luke, chapter 19, the book of Luke, chapter 19, and uh, verse 28. When you find that, will you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word as we honor God's Word and the reading of it? Luke, chapter 19, verse 28. I want to read a few verses here with you in God's Word. Luke 19, verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh unto Bethage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found, even as he had said unto them, as they were loosening the colt, the owners that are all said unto them, why loosen ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is God's word. May God speak to us today from it. Let's bow for prayer. Father, bless these words to our heart. Help us, Lord, to have ears to hear. And Lord, help me to be clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I title my sermon today on this very special Sunday. As we know, we call it Palm Sunday. But the title of the sermon today is, Why Should You Follow Jesus? You ever witness to a person and ask this question, Why should I follow Jesus? Jesus. And what you probably begin to do is you probably begin to lay out some reasons for them following Christ. Well, if you follow the Lord Jesus, he will give you abundant life. He will give you peace with God. He'll give you new purpose and meaning in your life. He'll help you to overcome temptations that those temptations can destroy your life. He'll make you happy. Or you'll say something like being a Christian is the greatest life in the world. And then you invite them to church. And they come and they hear the gospel and they see people perhaps come forward at the invitation and they decide, well, you know what? I'll give Jesus a try. And so they come forward and they make a decision. Emotional appeal uh, is given and they make a decision to follow Christ. And then they begin to come to church. But then by and by, they become a little more sporadic. It's a little more difficult to get up from some Sunday mornings. They're not here as faithful. And they seem to be doing okay, but suddenly bad news hits. They encounter some trial or some tragedy in their life. Perhaps a mother is dying of cancer slowly and painfully, and they're wondering why the Lord doesn't answer their prayers. And about this time, they run into some old friends who remind them of what the old life was like, and they kind of pull them their direction. And their Christian experience seems to fade into the background. And later you might meet this person and you might say something like, well, what happened to you? And they say, well, I tried Jesus and it helped for a while. And if it works for you, if Jesus works for you, that's great. But right now it's not where I am. Why did this person's faith fade away? Well, they made some faulty assumptions. And the first assumption that was faulted that they made was this. They saw spiritual truth as something that is personal and subjective, not something that is absolute and objective. We see this a lot in our postmodern world today. If it's good for you, if it works for you, that's fine. It doesn't work for me. And so, therefore, to them, truth is subjective. I have to find something better for myself, they say. But the test of spiritual truth is not whether it makes you feel good or not. But there's a second faulty assumption that they make, and that is that personal happiness is the most important thing in life. They think like this, well, God, if he's there, he exists to make me happy. 
And if Jesus can make me happy, if Jesus can make me feel good, I'll give him a try. But if following Jesus doesn't make me happy, if following Jesus doesn't make me feel good, then, okay, I'll try something else. And they later say, well, at least I gave Jesus a shot. At least I gave him a chance. You can't fault me for that. In short, many people give Jesus a shot and follow him for a lot of reasons, a lot of different reasons. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking, what does this have to do with Palm Sunday? It has a lot to do with it. Because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Sunday to present himself as the Messiah, there are a lot of people following Jesus for a lot of different reasons. They had a lot of different rationale or, or in their thinking. The disciples followed Christ. They saw him as the Messiah and King, but they mistakenly thought that he would set up his rule right there, then and now, on the throne of David. Others in the crowd saw him strictly in political terms. There were Jews there that wanted him to immediately set up his kingdom to overthrow Rome, to give them kind of a welfare state. And, you know, after all, they saw Jesus feed the multitudes. If he's our king, we'll have a welfare state. We'll have free food. That's a good deal. And then there were others that saw his miracles. They were astonished. The most recent miracle was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And they hoped that Jesus would use his power to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. And so, therefore, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, you know what you found? Multitudes of people surrounding him. Some scholars estimate that perhaps there were 200,000 people that were surrounding him. There are even more people that were worshiping during that festival season in Jerusalem. Some estimate 2 million worshipers all told. 200,000 of them crowded around Jesus while he was riding into Jerusalem that day. And you know what they were crying? They were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. But you know what? Those cheers faded very quickly. And just a few days later, they were saying that same crowd, that same fickle crowd, we're saying, crucify him. Crucify him. Why? What happened? Why the defection? Why the change? I believe it was in part because these various people had a wrong concept of who Jesus was. And they were following him for what they thought they could get out of him. For what they thought they could gain. They had more of a man-centered theology. It's all about me. It's about what he can give me rather than a God-centered theology where it says it's all about him. Why should we follow Jesus? Listen very carefully. Let me tell you why you should follow Jesus. Because he is Lord. He's Lord. We should follow Jesus because of that, not just because of what he can do for us. And by the way, I'm not denying that Jesus can do things for us. He does do things for us. In fact, he does everything for me. He's my shepherd. He watches over me. He protects me. He does more for me than I have time to name here this morning. I love the psalmist when he said, he performs all things for me. He performs all things for me. But I am saying that the main reason we should follow Jesus is not because what he can do for us, but because of who he is. Because of who he is. What if following Jesus cost you? What if following Jesus meant not necessarily happiness? Because happiness is dependent upon your happenings, right? Joy is an inside job. We have inward joy that the Lord gives. But happiness isn't always a guarantee. There are some Christians in some places in the world that for them following Jesus means martyrdom. It means suffering. It means persecution. What if you have to suffer for following Jesus? Would you still follow him? We should still follow him because of who he is. And what we see here, what I want to give you quickly in this passage in Luke chapter 19, the verses that we read, are really four aspects of the lordship of Christ that give us solid reasons to follow him. And so if you're taking notes, just write down number one. We follow Jesus because Jesus is Lord of providential circumstances. This is the first thing I see here in Luke chapter 19. Look again in verse 28. 
It says, and when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. This story inaugurates the week leading to the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion of Christ, the Passion Week. And what this really reveals, this whole narrative here, is that he was in absolute control over his circumstances. Make no mistake about it, friend. Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Jesus was Lord over the circumstances. No one took his life. He willingly laid his life down, according to the scripture, according to prophecy. He was not deluded by the cheering crowd. He was not intimidated by the threats of the Pharisees. He lived under the precise timetable of the heavenly father. And what we see here happening in Luke is this pilgrimage, this final pilgrimage that Jesus takes as he ascends up into Jerusalem. And in fact, Go back to chapter 9. Look in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Let me just show you this verse because really this starts off his final pilgrimage into Jerusalem. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says this, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. What does received up mean? In other words, it was time for him to go to heaven. It was time for him to uh, finish his ministry on earth. It was coming to an end. It was time for him to fulfill the reason why he had come to earth. It was time for him to set his face towards Jerusalem. And so it says that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And then from there on, from that part of Luke, the rest of the uh, book, really, we see Jesus purposely going on a journey, kind of a zigzag journey through Galilee and then through Samaria and then through Perea and then finally into Judea. This was his final journey. During this final journey, he ministered to at least 35 localities, timing his journey just right in order to end up in Jerusalem right at the time of the Passover. It was right at the time of the Passover. Again, look at chapter 19 and look at verse number 28. It's really the whole narrative is set off by the phrase he went or came near. Look at verse 28. And went he, excuse me, and when he had thus spoken, he went before. Notice where he went before ascending up. Look at verse number 36, where it says, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And look at verse number 41, where it says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city. So you get the idea. He's moving closer to Jerusalem. He's getting closer to the city. He stops in Jericho for two days. And while they're in Jericho, what does he do? He he leads Zacchaeus to salvation. And then he heals two blind men. And then he begins making the ascent up to Jerusalem. Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet above sea level. And so literally it's a 17-mile journey going upward. I've, I've gone up that road several times. Thank God in a bus. But when Jesus made this journey, he was on foot. And there was a crowd of people that were around him. Many of these people he had healed. This was a parade of pilgrim worshipers going to Jerusalem, making their pilgrimage there for the Passover. A huge crowd of people as they were streaming into the city during this festive season. As I said, estimates give it around two million people. And Jerusalem was the place. This was the place that was prophesied in the Old Testament. This was the place where Abraham took his son Isaac many thousands of years before this, where he sacrificed or took Isaac in a sacrifice. And of course, you know the story. The Lord said, don't do any harm to the lad. This was a picture of Calvary, but it was right here in this area. And this was the right time. Jesus knew he was on God's timetable. Many times we hear Jesus saying during his earthly ministry, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But it says in John 12, 23, Jesus said this, the hour has come that the son of man should be crucified. This was this. He said on Palm Sunday, as he was riding into Jerusalem, he said, my hour has come. This is the time. Time for the Son of God to die. You know, again, what this tells me, that he is in sovereign control of every detail. But I rest on the truth of the sovereignty of God. My head rests on the pillow of God's sovereignty. 
If I didn't believe that God was sovereign over the circumstances of my life, I don't think I can continue on. I follow Jesus because he is the Lord of providential circumstances. He is sovereign over all things. The death of Jesus, again, was not an accident. It was something that was prophesied by God before the foundations of the world. Those wicked hands that crucified Christ, they would be judged for it, but make no mistake about it. What they did was, was it was written in eternity past that he would die for sin. The Bible makes that clear. Nothing can thwart God's purpose, not even the plots and schemes of evil men. They can't thwart the purpose of God. They can only establish the purpose of God. But here's the second thing. I follow Jesus because he's Lord of providential circumstances. But number two, Jesus is the Lord of physical creation. Look at the rest of it. Look at verse 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethage and Bethany at the mount called Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, go ye into the village over against you, into which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. Now, the fact that Jesus is Lord over creation is evident in the fact that he wrote, he rode an unbroken colt into Jerusalem. Now, I'm no horseman, but I know that you don't climb onto an unbroken colt and expect a smooth ride. And yet Jesus did that. This colt received him. And notice the preparation of verse 29. When he was come nigh to Bethage and Bethany. Bethage was a little village between Jerusalem and Bethany. Bethage means house of figs. Bethany means house of dates. And a traveler approaching Jerusalem heading east would come to Bethany first. It was about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And then he would pass through Bethage on the slope headed down into Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. So Jesus stops at Bethany. This was the place where he resurrected Lazarus, and people still remember him there. They were there to see Jesus. Many crowds had come just for that, and they also wanted to see Lazarus, the man that he had resurrected from the dead. And then Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, look, go down to this village against us. That He was in Bethany, so that would be Bethage. He said, and when you go down there, you're going to find a colt in this village. This colt will be tied. He said, no man has ever sat on this colt. Loose him and bring him to me. Now, question, how did Jesus know that? We get a glimpse of divine omniscience here. This one little foal that has never been ridden, it was created, we could say it's as if God had created this little colt for this purpose to carry this one rider, the King of Kings. He was carried, Jesus was carried in the womb of a woman who never knew a man. He will be carried on the back of a colt that had never been ridden. He will be buried in a tomb where no one had ever been laid. All of this speaks of sacred use. Sacred use. And we see the proof of his deity. He knew that the colt would be there. He knew that it had never been ridden on. And then Jesus said, if anybody asks you, what are you doing? I mean, this, there's a lot of people in this area at this time. When someone would see that, they would probably think they're stealing this. And he, Jesus said, look, if anybody asks you, if the owner asks you, what are you doing? Just say the Lord hath need of him and that will be enough. The people around there, they knew who Jesus was, and they did call him Lord. They knew he was there. They knew he was going into the Passover. And sure enough, that happened. The men asked, what are you doing? And he said, the Lord has need of him. And, and that was it. These owners were probably thrilled that their cult was going to carry in Jesus to, this, to Jerusalem. And then notice the placement. Look at verse number 35. <clears throat> it says, and they brought him to Jesus, that is, this cult. And they cast their garments upon the colt. That is a makeshift saddle that they put there on the colt. And verse 35, and they set Jesus thereon. This is the humble coronation of Jesus the King. And all the coronations that have ever been held in the world's history to honor a monarch, no monarch even comes close to what Jesus deserves by way of honor. There's never, never been anyone so supreme, so majestic, so magnificent, so glorious. No one even comes close. And this doesn't look like much, perhaps, but it reveals him as the divine creator who has control over 
his creation because this unbroken cult receives Jesus completely. That's one smart animal. I wish some people had the sense of that cult. To receive him. As the almighty creator. As who he is. And that's who Jesus is. He is the creator of all things. The Bible says everything that was made was made by him. He's the creator of it all. We're not here as a result of random chance. Billions of years of evolution. Evolution is the biggest blasphemous lie ever given by man. Jesus made it all. He's the Lord of providential circumstances. He's the Lord of physical creation. But also write down this, number three. He's the Lord of prophetic calendars. Because look what it says in verse 36. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and he said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. This was a huge day on God's prophetic calendar. In fact, look at verse 42, saying, If thou didst know, even thou, at least in this thy day. Notice the emphasis on this thy day, on this very day. It's as if Jesus is saying, don't you understand what is happening on this day? This is, this is not just my day. This is your day. This is an important day. Why was this important? Because this day was written on the prophetic calendar of God. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, Jesus was fulfilling prophecies about this very thing. And there are many prophecies, but let me, let me mention three of them quickly. First of all, there's the prophecy of the ride where he rides in on this cold. This is prophesied in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming unto you. And he comes riding on this donkey, this, this foal as a symbol of humility. He didn't ride on a white horse as a symbol of warrior strength. He's coming as the humble savior. So he comes riding on this colt into Jerusalem very humbly. And as he comes in, notice what it says in verse 36. The people, they spread their clothes in the way. Why are they doing that? Now, he has ascended. He's ascending the western slope of the Mount of Olives from Bethany. And they're spreading their clothes out. And that's a symbol of submission. You know, um, people would, would bow down before a king in that day. Well, obviously, they weren't going to throw themselves in front of that animal. So what they did was they threw their garments in front as a symbol of submission. Because you would always bow down low in the presence of a king. That's why their thrones were, were elevated. And here they're saying, we submit to who you are. We submit to your authority. We place ourselves symbolically under you by throwing our robes there. But then there's a prophecy of the song in verse 37 it says, as they went, they began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, saying, verse 38, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And this was, again, prophesied out of the Old Testament. They're quoting Psalm 118, verses 22 to 27. This is a kingly reference from the Psalms. And the crowd modifies it slightly by saying, Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so this is prophesied. And so there's a caravan of pilgrims. You can just picture it in your mind as he's ascending upward. They're throwing their clothes in front of them. People are dancing around them. Hundreds and hundreds of people. And they're singing this psalm. And as he crests the top of the hill, and then he begins to descend downward into the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us in John 12 that people inside the city already there, hearing about what's going on. They run out of the eastern gate and the crowd gets bigger and bigger as he begins moving into Jerusalem. Again, the estimates are about 200,000 people. And the Bible says they begin to cut down palm leaves. It says that in Matthew 21, verse 8, these were 
uh, palm trees. This is why we call Palm Sunday. They would throw these down in front of the Lord Jesus again as a symbol of submission, but also as a symbol of glory. Did you know the palm leaves were used in the Feast of Sukkot? That is the Feast of the Tabernacles in the Old Testament. It had symbolized glory and they were welcoming their Messiah and they were singing and saying Hosanna, which means save now. But then there's a prophecy of the day. Did you know that this very day was written in the Old Testament? Write down in your notes, Matthew, or excuse me, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. This is when this specific day was prophesied. In Daniel 9, 26, it says this, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now listen to this. Daniel prophesied that from the decree of Artaxerxes to the time the Messiah would come to Jerusalem and be cut off would be a total of 69 weeks, or we could say 69 seven-year periods, meaning the Messiah would, be, would come in 483 years. Now, remember, the Jewish years consisted of 360 days, not 366. So if you do the math, and I'm not good at math, so I figured all this up earlier, all right? I'm not doing this in my head. And I checked the numbers. This would be a total number of days. This would be 173,880 days. And if you were to count 173,880 days from the command to restore the city, that was given on March 14. 445 B.C., and you count that many days, 173,880 days, you know what you come to? You come to April the 6th, 32 A.D. This is the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. The very day. It was written in the prophetic calendar. This is why Jesus, he knew, he knew, he knew the time. This is why he accepts their praise. You know, all during Jesus' earthly ministry, he would allow no public recognition of who he is. He would push it away, but not on this day. He accepts their praise. He accepts their singing because he is the Messiah. And he comes and he officially presents himself as the Messiah. And not everybody was happy about it. Look at verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitudes said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. They couldn't stand that Jesus was getting all of this praise. And I love the, the response of Jesus in verse 40. He answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You know what he meant by that? And by the way, this is the, this is the fourth point that I want to give you. And that is that uh, he is the Lord of promised condemnation. The Lord of promised condemnation. You see, Jesus understood the crowds. And actually, when you read that in verse 40, he said, if, if these should hold their peace, actually, the Greek verb there is future indicative, future indicative active. In other words, we could say it like this. Jesus was actually saying to the Pharisees, they will in the future hold their peace. That is going to happen because you know what? A few days later, they're not saying anything. This fickle crowd that was saying Hosanna. They were silent. And again, later on, they'll say, crucify him. And so Jesus was actually saying here, they will hold their peace. And when they do hold their peace, the stones will cry out. The stones will cry out. What stones was he talking about? There are some that think that all nature will praise if the people are silent. And by the way, all nature already does praise him every day, every, every sunrise sings praise to, to the creator. That already happens. I think it means that the stones of the temple that bear witness to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, they will one day cry out. Chryzo is literally the word scream. They will scream out. How will the stones of the temple scream out? Because the people would grow silent. And Jesus knew that with the exception of just a handful of people that really believed on who he was and truly repented and turned to him. The majority of Israel rejected him. Because what does the Bible say? He came unto his own and his own received him not. And so they would grow silent. And Jesus knew this. So look at verse number 41. And, and when he was come near. 
he beheld the city and he wept over it. Why does he begin to cry? On this beautiful celebration, Jesus begins to weep. He begins to cry. The word for weeping here is a very strong word. It's not a quiet weeping. It's the strongest word in the Greek language for weeping. It's weeping over the death of a loved one. It's a, it's a, it's a loud lamentation. Jesus' shoulders begins to shake and he begins to heave and he begins to cry. Why is he crying? He's crying over the city. Why is he crying? Because he knows that the majority of people there have not received him for who he was. They have not repented and of their sin. They have not turned to him. There was a, a remnant that did. And all through the Gospel of Luke, all the way back in chapter 4, in chapter 5, in chapter 6, in chapter 7, in chapter 8, all the way through, we see Jesus offering them again and again the good news of peace, the gospel, if they would simply turn to him and repent and receive him for who he is, they would have eternal life and salvation. But their unbelief has hardened them. Look down in verse number 42, saying, he wept saying, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Here he's talking about their own hardness their own unbelief, their own unbelief has hid these things from their eyes. And so therefore, what, you, what does Jesus do in the last two verses? He predicts what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. In verse 43, for thy day shall come upon thee, thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in one, on every side and shall lay thee even with the, the, the ground and thy children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And what's Jesus speaking about there in verse 42 and verse 40, down to verse 44? He's speaking about the time when in 70 AD, the Romans would come and surround the city of Jerusalem. They would besiege the city. Millions of Jews would die. They would take this city over. I don't have time to go into all the details of this. You can read Josephus, and he gives a detailed account of all the things that took place. All these prophecies that Jesus made came true. And the bottom line is because these people did not receive Jesus because they rejected him, they had a serious price to pay. And I want to tell you, we need to learn this from this narrative. You can't be neutral about Jesus, friend. You can't be neutral. You either receive him for who he is or you don't. And no decision is a decision. And Jesus said, all this is going to happen because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You did not recognize this was the time of God's coming to you, visiting you. This might be the time of visitation for some people here today. I know there are some people out there and they get this idea. I'll come to God whenever I'm ready. You know what? You'll come to God in the time of his visitation. And if you don't come then you'll have a serious price to pay. You're not the one calling the shots, dear friend. He is. And you better receive him for who he is. So why follow Jesus? Why? Because he's the Lord of providential circumstances. He's the Lord of physical creation. He's the Lord of prophetic calendars. He's the Lord of promise condemnation. We follow him because of who he is. The Lord. And if you want a faith that perseveres in the trials of this life, trust in Jesus because of who he is. Not just because of what he can do for you. Let's bow for prayer together. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, friend, I just want to ask you. You know, sometimes I think people think that preachers preach because they want to manipulate hearts and they want to get decisions, and there's all kind of reasons why people think that we do this. Let me tell you something, dear friend. I just want you to know Jesus, plain and simple. I want you to know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. That's it. I don't get paid extra because you make a decision for Christ. It's not about any other reason than for you, your soul. I plead with you here today, if you've never trusted Christ, friend, 
turn to him. Not because of what he can do for you. And by the way, he can do a whole lot for you. But that's not enough. I'm not asking you to turn to him for any of those reasons. I'm asking you to turn to him and repent of your sin and receive him because of who he is. He is the Lord. And friend, one day he's coming again. And this time when he comes, he'll be the judge. And this judgment that we see here in this narrative is just a a little foretaste of the judgment that is yet to come for all those who have just remained neutral, haven't made any decision. But as I said, no decision is a decision. So I want to ask you, friend, would you be willing right there where you are to turn to Christ? Would you be willing to pray, reach out to him and say, Lord, today, this very hour, on this Palm Sunday, I receive you as my Lord. I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Is that your prayer? Can I pray for you? Would you lift your hand? I'm not going to embarrass your friend, but I want to pray for you. Anyone here like that? You say, yes, I want to do this today. Today is the day of your visitation, perhaps. Are you absolutely certain of your soul's salvation? Then for those of us who know him, friend, I pray that we would cling to him all the more, trust in him all the more, submit to him all the more. Father, bless again these words to hearing hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for making him the propitiation for our sins that we might have eternal life. And fully and freely with all our heart, we confess today that Jesus Christ is Lord, our King. And we pray in Jesus' name.